A pleasant morning to all of you again. Good morning, everyone. All of us have sat down for a long time. So without taking much time, please, may we all stand for a moment. Let's stand on our feet for a moment. Okay. Facing you is my right hand, so let's all of us turn to the right and stretch your two arms and massage the person on the shoulders right in front of you for a few minutes. Just massage the person that is in front of you for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Some of you are doing a good massage job. All right. Okay, now let's turn to the right. Let's turn to the left, and that's your right. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. May we all be seated right now for section number four. Okay. Section number four. Yes, with the title, Making the Vision of Zechariah, chapter 8, 20 to 23, a reality in the context of religious pluralism will be presented by Pastor Weston Mbirili. Pastor comes to us from the country of Zimbabwe, and currently he's a PhD candidate here in IS. May we all give him our undivided attention as he'll be presenting to us this exciting topic, making, making the vision of Zechariah chapter 8, 20 to 23, a reality in the Asian context. Thank you very much. Pastor, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Brother Joseph, for your kind words of introduction. Um, a very good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's a con um, <clears throat> I would like to begin by congratulating the conveners of this meeting, uh, AATS, uh, the, and the committee that was led by Pastor Ron Genebago. I think you've done a fantastic job, and may God bless you. Um, I'm speaking here as an outsider. I'm not an Asian, uh, although I've had uh, contact with Asia. And, but I'm sharing what uh, some concepts that probably could be relevant um, from a biblical perspective. And so, making the vision of Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 to 23 a reality in the Asian context. And by the Asian context, we are talking here about uh, the situation of there being multiple religious systems or religious configurations across uh, this beautiful and populous continent. And so, by way of introduction, Asia is the most populous region uh, of the world. This uh, region also has a number of the world's largest uh, religions and from a missiological point of view that's where we also find the 10 foot window which is uh, an area that has been recognized as being the most populated in the world actually hosting two-thirds of the world's population and yet also one of the most difficult to evangelize so this is in the context of adventist missiology or the missiological endeavor of the Adventist Church. And uh, the church exists for mission, out, uh, mission outreach to all the world. This is uh, a fundamental principle. The church, the Adventist Church, exists with a consciousness of an urgent sense of mission. The church understands that it exists for mission. Um, and then, and yet, the problem now, the problem is that Asia has largely remained impervious to the Christian message and uh, missiological endeavors. So there is a biblical model that could be helpful, possibly helpful, in, in such a case as we are confronted with in the Asian context. So Asian Adventists, this is also a concept that um, is of significance in my paper and in my presentation this morning. Asian Adventists... I imagine them as citizens of two worlds, the Occidental and the Oriental. Um, 
So this is like the 10-foot window, and most of the Asian countries and populations are within this area. Two-thirds of the world's population are within this area. And this is also the area that remains largely impervious to the Christian, uh, to Christian missiological endeavors. And this has also been identified by the Adventist uh, Church, as, uh, along with many other Christian missions. And so, um, for example, we are told that <coughs> we find some of the three world's largest religions uh, in this area, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, Islam, with those numbers that is in, uh, in hundreds of millions and billions in this particular part of the world. And also, according to the um, Global Christianity, a study that was uh, in 2013 with a projection of what the picture might look like in 2020, it's, it's not very promising for Christianity or Christian missions because it's showing that there is increase, a uh, great increase Indeed, in people that, are sub that subscribe to other religious traditions other than Christianity. And so, according to the numbers that are given here, in their millions, and we see that across the world, of course, the largest non-Christian uh, persons or people are concentrated in the Asian region. So, this is what I'm talking about when talking about the Asian context. The reality of there being so many uh, religious traditions and faith, and yet on the other hand, an endeavor to reach out to these people with the gospel, with the message of Jesus Christ. So um, now the vision of Zechariah is recorded here in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 to 23. I'm reading the conclusion of that uh, chapter, and it says here, so I'm reading, this is NIV. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come, and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Almighty. I myself am going, and many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem and seek the Lord Almighty. And to, to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we've heard that the Lord God is with you. Wow. Can you imagine when a day comes when this becomes a reality in Asia. When people are clamoring for the gospel and they, in other words, the situation we see here, the picture that is painted is that of a faith that has gone viral. It's no longer being propagated by the Jews themselves, but it's non-Jews who are sharing on whatever platforms they're sharing. Have you heard the situation in Jerusalem? And they say, ah, let us go. I myself am going. In other words, they are actually evangelizing among themselves as non-believers in God. And yet, all roads are leading to Jerusalem. So this is a, an, an eschatological picture that is painted by Zechariah. And I believe it's an expression of God's desire. What he had desired for his people, uh, Israel how they were supposed to evangelize, how they were supposed to reach out. It was supposed to get to a point, not where they are shouting so much, but where the faith itself becomes so viral. So could this happen in the Asian context? If so, how? If not, why? So looking at this uh, chapter, I've looked, uh, analyzed and tried to come up with themes. So it's like a thematic approach. And so what I've done, uh, Dr. Mora, is that I've tried to look at uh, the words that are used uh, in this and trying to find, of course, on the, <coughs> we have the verses where we have Zechariah 8 on the extreme left side, and then we've got the text um, or part of the text right there in one column, and then my translation of that text, and then my interpretation on the extreme right. 
So basically, what you're finding here is that uh, in verse 20 and verse 22, we hear about many people, these uh, many people. In other words, we have uh, the word many modifying the pe people here uh, as an adjective. So these, these are not few people. So in uh, my interpretation, we are talking about large populations here. So if we're talking large population, I think that relates to Asian context. And then uh, we've got also inhabitants of many cities, and there are many large cities in Asia. So these are large urban populations. So maybe you're thinking Shanghai, we are thinking New Delhi or whatever other uh, such kind of places. And then we've got here uh, strong nations, okay? Regoim Atsumim, strong nations. This is strength, maybe economic. Uh, it could be in military terms. It could be because of their populations. But whatever the case, we also have this reality in Asia. We have got global powers in this, on this continent or in this continent. So, and then we've got many uh, from all languages. So, languages imply cultural diversity. So, there are cultural diversities expressed in the different languages. Uh, that we find here in the situation in, uh, in Zechariah, the context. And then we've got uh, the nations. In the Hebrew Bible, <coughs> excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold. So in the Hebrew Bible, whenever the nations are mentioned, it already implies not only national identity, but also religious difference from Israel. So for example, when you look at the case of Jonah, when they ask him, what is your nation? Where are you from? They wanted to identify the God he worships by identifying his nationality first. So nationality was synonymous with religious identity and difference between nations. So whenever it talks like nations in the Hebrew Bible, already implied in that is religious difference. So I also thought this is a theme that also applies uh, or connects with the Asian context and the reality. So the situation that we find here is that God had wanted a situation for Israel where the faith or the uh, faith in God was going to go viral among the nations, and many people were going to come to Jerusalem and worship the Creator God uh, and subscribing to His plan of salvation. So, but. How, could, how, was, how would this be possible? How would that happen? <coughs> what we read is the last part of the chapter. So what I did was to go back up in the chapter to see what had preceded this particular conclusion. And what I found is that um, there were things that had happened before that are mentioned. For example, the people of Judah had not been perfect previously. Because this is now in a post-exilic context. In the pre-exilic or before they had gone to exile, they had not been perfect as a nation. They had been rebellious and disobedient and had provoked the Lord to anger. And he had, in turn, punished them. That's according to verse 14. The Lord had abandoned them and they had become a curse among the nations in which is the opposite of the blessing they were meant to be according to the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and, uh, and also, they had suffered indignities such as exile, war, social instability, and national insecurity, according to verse 10. So these are the realities that had previously prevailed. And because of all these, they had failed to reach their mission objective as God had intended for them as a nation. So because they had basically adopted a way of life which was similar to those nations around them whom they were supposed to influence and reach out to. So because of that, there was no, I can say what, spiritual osmotic gradient that was created. There was no need, there was nothing attractive in them because they were just like everybody else. They became like the nations. So they could not appeal to the nations. This is how they had lived. But uh, the picture that we find of what they could become, now that they've come back from exile, God is uh, clicking the reset button. They are given another chance. And God says, if you live in this way, 
this will be the result. Many nations will come. So the Lord's uh, great yearning for Jerusalem leads in him, showing his compassion uh, on his city. He returns to Jerusalem. That's the first thing. God says, I have compassion. Now I'm returning. That is uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. That is where the chapter begins. I'm returning to Jerusalem. And then exiles are brought back to Jerusalem. God returns to Jerusalem. He brings them back from exile. Now, he's, reconfig he's resetting the whole community and giving them another chance. And then the people who are brought back are transformed. They are a transformed nation. In other words, this is kind of like revival and reformation in reality. Uh, described as many people and I shall... Okay, they shall be my people and I shall be their God in truth and righteousness. That is chapter 8, verse 8b. <coughs> and then it says here, first, these are some of the qualities that we find among these returned exiles, transformed society. Holiness, truthfulness, honesty, justice, all these have now become commonplace in their society. These are the very things that the pre-exilic prophets used to uh, talk about and appeal to the nation to come to. Um, and now they become a reality. Now they become a reality. So the right relationship between the people and their right relationship with God, rather it should be the people's relation, right relationship with God makes them have right relations with each other. And it transforms the society um, and the nation. So... <clears throat> As a result, covenantal blessings that God mentions in Deuteronomy 28 become a reality among the people or in the nation. And we find here, <clears throat> when analyzing these particular elements, also using the same pattern as before, what we find is that some of these covenantal blessings, we find, for example, that uh, in verse 4, elderly men and women shall sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Each one which is with his can in hand on account of old age. So there will be a lot of old people. A lot of old people in Jerusalem. And that translates to longevity. They will live long lives. And this is actually in, um, in, in, um, as an opposite or as an antithesis of the brevity of life which had become characteristic when war decimated their populations and their young people were dying at a tender age. So this actually implies long lives and also peace and security for them to attain that long life. And then uh, the streets of Jerusha Jerusalem shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. This implies high fertility. Many children being born. And so uh, we've got high fertility and also there's peace and security because life is going on as normal. And then there's also agricultural productivity because the heavens uh, are giving their rain, the earth is giving its produce, there is abundance of food, so there's food security. So these are some of the things that are mentioned in this chapter which precede that vision that we started with. So in other words, because of these realities, it is actually because of these concrete realities long lives, peace and security, tranquility, and uh, high fertility, and agricultural productivity and food security. It's these things which were actually the life ideals of those societies in Bible times. These are the things that actually become attractive and they arrest the attention of an otherwise uninterested and unwilling audience of the international community. And this is what attracts them to Jerusalem. Not careful explication of the sanctuary doctrine. It's concrete rea life realities which appeal. And the people are now coming to Jerusalem. Of course, as they come, they will then gain, get to learn and <clears throat> know more about this God. Okay? I've done 17 minutes. So, um, so Judas transformed society, appealed to those ideals that the ancients were always trying to achieve. In the end, it is not the power of the theological arguments and so on. So they become a blessing. In this way, the Jew, Jews or the Jewish society or community 
becomes the blessing that God had always intended, according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, <coughs> verse 5 to 8, when God says, if you do not deviate from these principles, all these people will come and say, what other nation is so great a God among them? We live so near to them. And this will be attractive. This was God's plan right during the Exodus, even before that, during the time of Abraham, 400 years before. So when you look in biblical theology, uh, defined here by uh, Diroki, as uh, you can see right there, in other words, what is the testimony of Scripture to this particular theme? Uh, we find that in the Old and New Testaments, the Bible uh, expresses God's desire that all nations be reached. This was God's desire in, as given in the Abrahamic covenant and throughout in the prophets, also uh, very common in the Psalms, that all nations will come and worship the Lord. Okay? And that implies they are coming from divergent religious uh, backgrounds and cultural realities. And so in the New Testament, it is God's plan uh, for God so loved the world. I mean, this is the gospel to all the world. And uh, also, as we understand in the context of the three angels' messages, the proclamation is to be made to all nations around the world. And so throughout, we have the view. Uh, the view is eschatological. This is a picture of what could be, what could happen. <coughs> so it uh, is an expression of God's desire. So we have seen this as what happened, uh, and we can say then, in other terms, it's like a hypothetical situation of what could become, but at the same time, <coughs> an expression of God's desire, how God desires for his people to reach out. So how could this apply? So looking at those themes that I found in the text, I try to bring them into uh, the reality of the Asian context. Understanding life aspiration, it's important to understand the life aspirations and ideals, ideals of the Asian people. And uh, I also believe that those ideals that we find in Zechariah, like uh, living long lives and uh, um, being productive in terms of fertility, uh, economic, agricultural security, and so on and so on, they are very important, even in Asia. So the church has to function in a way that understands like the social order. In other words, I found when I was reading in the literature, looking at uh, religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on, I found that many of the uh, teachings and practices also relate to these same themes of creating social order, cohesion, and uh, things like that in society and also in nature. But however, there are potential challenges that we need to be aware of because uh, Adventism, as we have it, it comes in the mold of Western, in a Western mold. But Asia is in the East. And so there are certain things that we need to be aware of, such as uh, in the Western way of thinking, there's so much of individualism and so on and so on, which expresses itself in many other ways. Um, okay? There are many things. The, the clock is really ticking fast. <coughs> okay, let me say, um, it is very important for the church to do whatever it can <coughs> to promote and be relevant to these ideals, life ideals, such as peace and security, relevant to the family. Most Asian cultures are known to be high-context cultures, as opposed to the Western cultures, which are low-context cultures, where individualism is higher than the society itself. And so the church needs to find ways in which it can target not just individuals, but families and communities. And that is only possible, perhaps, by addressing felt needs of those communities. And that is only possible through studying and researching and analyzing those communities. So uh, it is important um, one of the challenges that could be there is that Christianity as we have it and associating as it does with the Western communities, some of the Western nations also have 
uh, a monopoly, uh, or rather a, um, a capacity to do a lot of, uh, okay, maybe let me leave that out. I may not have enough time to expand on that. But um, it is very important. Some of the concepts that are in the West are not necessarily in line with some of the ways that are in the East. I can give, for example, we have got all these examples um, in some of the religions here in the East where there is, um, where there is emphasis on peace and uh, respect for life, not killing other creatures and so on. In the West, many people, it's not everyone, but it's like a common idea. Many people can cross the ocean and travel to that country, kill a giraffe, not because they want to eat it, but they just want to take a picture and post on Instagram. And for many people in the West, that's cool. But it's very horrific for many in the, in the, in the East. How can you do that? But for Easterners, I mean for Western, so it's important for us. And um, there are a lot of other things in, geo, in the geopolitical context. So when many Easterners maybe look in the West, they tend to identify those countries that historically identify as Christians sometimes as perpetrators of violence in certain parts of the world, and many get disenchanted with Christianity at large, and that can, be, uh, that can create a disadvantage. So it's, it is important for the church to create, uh, to establish rapport, like through the public affairs and religious liberty, which the church already has, and I think it would also be very important to create a more uh, relevant presence even rotating the general conference sessions to different parts of the world and not hosting them in one country only. And yet there is so, I think it would create awareness uh, in other parts of the world. I think FIFA understands that very well. So, <clears throat> long, okay, living long lives, we have got the Sardinians and we also have, no, not Sardinians, we have got people in the Valley of Hunza and the Okinawans in Japan, some of the people who have been known to live the longest and the happiest, healthiest lives in the world, let's take advantage of this because it relates uh, to the Adventist uh, approach and way of, uh, I mean, understanding. And so we've got all these. We should capitalize on that, okay? Let me get to my conclusion. Let me get to my conclusion. And my conclusion says, the church faces a daunting task in evangelizing the Asian region. Zechariah 8, verse 20 to <coughs> 23, offers a model of how God's work could become viral in a place of religious pluralism like uh, Asia. For success, the church should seek ways to be relevant to the communities in which it operates. There should be more of concrete and practical things rather than just fine theories and talking about the sweet by and by, they should also be thinking of the here and now. The church should be willing to get its hands dirty, not in a dirty way, but in a positive way by doing concrete things that address felt needs. Let's all join hands to make the dream of Zechariah 8 a reality. Adventism is built to make such things happen. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pastor Weston. Now the floor is open to questions that any of us might have. Questions? Okay, there is a hand up there. Pastor, thank you for the message. Actually, in the West, yes, we, and in the East, as we see, they're family-oriented. They do things together. But you have presented that the reason why um, the people who are wanted to be associated with the Jews is because of uh, success, progress, and uh, many things. So as we talk about the pronunciation in the region, as we preach, how can we be careful with the, uh, the gospel or prosperity gospel, you know? 
You see, that's what's going on with most of the evangelical churches, which are more preaching about progress, you know, progress, pro how can you succeed? And we see that one as the now, the temporal things now. So how can we divide? We want to attract them or we want to gain them through these things you have said, that they are like avenues. But how can we be careful with the prosperity gospel? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm thinking of is not in terms of like um, uh, prosperity gospel and so on, but there is transformation that comes when, wherever the gospel is preached. There should be transform transformation for the better. So what I'm talking about is the church should find ways in which, for example, we've got many countries in Asia and other parts of the world where people live in abject poverty and they are destitute. It's not enough to just talk about uh, the little horn and everything like that. As people are looking at that beast, some of them are actually wondering whether that can be eaten for a meal. And so because their felt need is that has not been addressed yet. So what I'm talking about is a, such a transformative uh, presence by the church which actually empowers people in their families as individuals, as families so that they are actually much better than they were at the end of the day than when the gospel first found them. It's not just cheap things about uh, you are going to be the richest billionaire or whatever uh, but it's actually transformation. It's salvation and lift that uh, I'm talking about that comes. That should the difference is, maybe in prosperity gospel, prosperity itself is the end objective. Once you become the richest person, they make you the pastor. They cannot allow someone who's richer, I mean, someone who's not as rich as, I mean, the richest person in the audience becomes the pastor. For them, that is, the, that's not the objective. This is a balanced view, holistic approach, which addresses all facets or, and aspects of life. But so far, I think we, we have a very good theology, but we are still... We are just theoretical. We need to find a way to be practical and relevant. As an example, in many parts of the world, you've got schools that have got land, and it's totally unproductive. You see people driving from a school that has a farm to buy tomatoes in the city and bring them to, to cook them in the farm. This is a reality with our church. Uh, and that kind of, the, I mean, level of being so theoretical I think it doesn't help the gospel. We need to be practical and relevant. Thank you very much. Any other question? We still have, I think, three more minutes. Okay, one more question, and we are done. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pastor Weston, and thank you also for listening. I'll give the mic now to Brother Mafil. Thank you.